Good morning. Good to see each one of you here on this beautiful Lord's Day. Sorry for the minute and a half late start. I can promise you this, we will not let you out a minute and a half early, all right? Just go ahead and get that settled. We're glad you're here, trusting the Lord to come and meet with us and help us today. Are you happy to be in God's house? Amen. Amen. No better place to be on a Sunday morning than in God's house, wherever you are. Man, I love Sunday mornings. And a wonderful time to worship and praise the Lord, and we hope that you've come to do just that. And uh, why don't we bow our heads and ask God to help us? We need Him. Dear Heavenly Father, we stand before you with a clear understanding that we need your help today. Dear Lord, we're thankful that we can come into your presence and talk to you as our Father. We can bring all of our cares, all of our burdens, all our concerns to you. And dear Lord, we know that you care for us. And dear Lord, you want to encourage hearts. You want to draw us to you. And Lord, if there is someone who is wayward today, we believe with all of our heart, you love us with such a love that God, you're wanting to call somebody to you. Dear Lord, whether they be here or whether they be online, Lord, our prayer is that our worship today would be in such a way that would be uh, magnifying of your name and helpful in the Holy Spirit as you would speak to hearts and lives. And God, as you would help us, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You look very weary, so we're going to let you stay seated. Good morning. Let's turn to page 503 and let's sing... Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword in song. Let's sing it this morning. 503. Sing it out. Called unto holiness, church of our God, purchase of Jesus, redeemed by his Oh 
225, 225, and can it be, let's sing it unto him this morning.
His love this morning, aren't you? I hope you have experienced it. I hope it's real in your heart and in your life. I'm, it, it just excites me that the God of the universe would tell us to come boldly to Him, not timidly, not with reservations, but coming boldly, saying, God, here I am, here's what I need. And He calls us to do that, and that's what we're doing this morning as we come to Him in prayer. We have thought about, and, and we have mentioned it oftentimes, those battling cancer, you all know those. Let's continue to pray that God would give the touch that is needed, the comfort and help that is needed. You can see the, the names listed up there, praying that God would work in those situations and go to those individuals and give the comfort and help and healing. Let's pray for Larry Mabus, who has back surgery on the 15th, praying for Dorothy McCoy, who has some serious heart issues that she is dealing with. Christine Young with her ankle, praying that God will give a touch there and help that um, and give healing. Let's pray for CCYC that begins tomorrow. The uh, group from here will be leaving tonight at midnight, praying that God gives us protection, but also praying for Pastor Holden as he, as he speaks. Sonia Vernon, as she's sharing as well, the leadership there, praying that God would, would work and move and help in, in CCYC. Let's pray for uh, Butch Heath and the Glicks as they close out the camp in Pennsylvania today. Continue to pray for our nation, revival in our church here, I'm praying for a spirit of revival, that we would have that passion and desire upon our hearts, that God would move on our nation and continue to work to bring about the salvation of souls. Would you stand with me this morning? Pastor Matt's going to come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray together in faith, believing that God is going to meet and, and answer our prayers. Again, join with us, please, together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for an amazing love, dear Lord, that found out me. Dear Lord, the songwriter said, dear Lord, you emptied yourself of all but love. Dear Lord, so that we could have a, a relationship with you, that we could be made righteous. Dear Lord, that we could have the hope of heaven, that we could have victory in our hearts and lives, that we could see the chains of sin break from our life, that we could stand here this morning and seeing now no condemnation have I to dread, dear Lord, because you have set us free, and you who the set sons, the Spirit sets free is free indeed. And, and dear Lord, we're thankful, we're thankful, dear God, today that we can come into your presence as a child of God, as one of your children. And dear Lord, just say, we love you. You. And Lord, we just want you to know that we appreciate all that you have done, all that you're doing, and what you're, how you're working in our lives. You're working among us, dear Lord, your leadership and guidance, your faithfulness to us. Dear Lord, through your precious Holy Spirit, we just want you to know that we love you and praise your name this morning. And God, we ask that you would help our hearts to continue to be open to you as, as you, our gentle shepherd, would lead us and guide us, dear Lord, as you would show us the ways that we ought to go and the, and the direction we ought to live, dear Lord. We ask that our hearts would just be sensitive to you, dear Lord, that we would see that relationship deepen and develop into greater, greater depths, dear Lord. We just love you this morning, and we're so thankful for your saving and sanctifying power in our lives. Lord, we come to you not only with praise, but we come to you with our petitions and thanking your Lord of the multitude of people who are hurting today from a variety of circumstances and situations. Dear Lord, whether it be an emotional need, whether it be uh, physical needs, whether it be financial struggles, whatever it may be, Lord, we know that you're, you're still God above all things, but we ask it, Lord, that you would minister to each and every one of these needs as you would see fit. Dear Lord, we know that and we are aware that you know exactly where we are, each and every one of us. And, and so, God, we're just asking that you would give wisdom and give direction and give leadership, give mercy, give patience, give, give grace. Lord, whatever it is needed, dear Lord, we ask that you administer to our hearts today. Dear Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for spiritual needs above and beyond everything else. Oh, God that you would help us to be individuals that live close to you, filled with the Spirit of God. Dear Lord, that we would be vessels, that we would be, dear Lord, individuals that, that you can use, dear Lord, to help draw people to you, dear Lord, that they may experience forgiveness, that they may experience joy and contentment and the joy of no condemnation. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, speak to those that are lost, draw them to yourself, 
and help us, dear Lord, in the furtherance of this service. Now, as we get ready to, to, to lift this morning tithes and offering, Lord, we thank you for the way you continue to help us to meet the needs here in our financial realm of Hope Sound Bible Church and the ministries here. We ask that, God, you would bless both gift and giver alike. Bless Brother Doyle as he would minister in song. Dear Lord, we ask that you would just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Bazone, for that good offertory, and thank you for your giving. This time we're going to have our time of fellowship, so I'd invite you to stand and reach across the aisle to welcome each of you here, and thank you for coming to worship with us here this morning.
wanted to mention a few announcements this morning before the Vernons sing. They can go ahead and start making their way um, to the mics. Just keep in mind, CCYC, those of you that are planning on going, we'll be leaving this evening at midnight from this side of the church. So make sure you meet at 1130. You can bring your luggage at that point, and we will load um, at that point. Make sure if you have not gotten in your, uh, your $100 for the trip, or your, your permission slip, or your medical release if you didn't go to youth retreat, your own person who didn't go. Make sure you bring those papers with you this evening. Um, if some of your plans have changed, please contact me and let me know if you have already left and I don't know that yet, or something along those lines. Um, let me know and we will we'll be leaving tonight at midnight. The only other announcement that we have is that there will be no uh, board meeting in July, so keep that in mind. Let's continue to worship as the Vernon sing. I don't know if it's the COVID left over or what. I've had a serious cough and breath problems ever since the 1st of January. But we're going to try. So from every stormy wind, I'm going through a storm right now. You are. And so let's worship together, shall we? Blessed be his name. sing 
And God has used them this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? We're going to focus our hearts and minds in as we prepare to hear the word of God preached. And so let's do a, take a second to do that. Lord, thank you for your presence in this service thus far. You've come, you've helped in, in the singing, in the time of fellowship, as we gave of offerings, and in different ways you have been here in this service. But we realize that one of the most important moments in this service is hearing your word preached. And we ask and we pray that you would be with Pastor Matt as he shares the word, as he preaches it. Would it not be him speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking through him? And dear Lord, give us open ears to hear the message that you would have to speak to us this morning. For what you do, we will give you all the praise. We love you today and we worship you with everything in us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother and sister Vernon, for that beautiful, beautiful song. Isn't it a beautiful thing to realize that it's there where sin does not molest no more? Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful thought. And reality, praise God. If you have your Bibles, if you turn with us to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In the last few weeks, we've, we've dealt with the different calls of God. Uh, we've talked a little on the call of reasoning. Isn't it wonderful when he says, come, let's reason together? What a beautiful thought that all of the excuses we bring as to why he can't or he shouldn't, he says, come, let's reason together. No matter where you've been, what you've done, I can forgive. Hallelujah. The call of repentance. He comes not to do anything else but to call sinners to repentance. Last week, we tried to look a little on the subject of his call to freedom. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And this morning, I would like to draw our attention to God's call to separation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start reading in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. May God add this blessing to his reading of his word. I have five points I'd like to share with you this morning. It's amazing sometimes how God brings truths to our minds. At least in my mind, I have found it to be this way. There are times, uh, if you will go in my office in one of my drawers there, you'll find a whole drawer full of papers with notes scribbled on them and uh, pink highlighters and red highlighters and red ink and blue highlighters and orange. And I mean, it's just a little paper with all sorts of scribbling that hopefully sometime, if the Lord would have us to preach that again, I can understand what I was trying to say. And then there's other times that as you're studying and as you're preparing, you're sitting down and you're just typing some things out and it just continues to come and it's in that type of form. And uh, as I look across this crowd, some of you say to me on many different occasions, I like it when you walk. And that's the paper type, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Others will say, I like it when you stand still. So somebody will be happy this morning as we stand still. For I felt like this is as I was just typing things out, the Lord was giving it this direction today. Five different things I would like to talk to us about God's call to us to be separate from this world. There's a reason. There's a reason. There's an underlying reason why God calls us out, his children, to be separated from this world. And I want to look at some of those this morning. I would preface this message by simply saying, first of all, let's jump right in. The call to be separate is, first of all, a command from God. In verse 17, we read these words, Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, saith 
the Lord. This is not something that some ragtag group of people 50 years ago decided they wanted to hustle up and to talk about to try to bring bondage and, and millstones around the necks of people. God himself, it says, the Lord says that he wants us, his children, those who have been redeemed, those who have been forever changed in their heart, he wants us to come out from the world and be a separate people. This is not just a hobby horse for people to preach about. It is the word of the Lord. Biblical separation recognizes that God has called Christians out of this world into personal and corporate purity in the midst of all of the sinful culture that is around us. He calls us out to be a separate people. I believe that as a Christian, we're under the constant tension of being a citizen of two worlds. We live in this world, but the Scripture would tell us we are as Christians citizens of another world, citizens of heaven. But yet, Paul, understanding and telling us that our citizenship is in heaven, he had practical things to say about us and our connection to earthly rulers and our relationships to them. When Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of God. It was his enemies that tried to trick him or impale him on, on the horns of the dilemma of paying or not paying taxes to Rome. And at that point, Jesus says as he takes a coin, whose image is on this coin? And of course, they answered Caesar's. And he says, God speaks. He says, uh, Jesus speaks, who is the express image of God, says, listen, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God. God that what is God's. Keeping a proper relationship between the two has always been a tightrope and a tension in a sense, but yet we as Christians have one underlying command, and that is we are to come out from the world and be separate from them. Jesus himself prayed in John 17, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one as thou hast sent me into this world, so send I them into the world. What was Jesus saying in his prayer? Simply this, Father, I'm not asking that you save them and then just whisk them out of this place, but I'm praying that you would save them and change them. And then as you sent me, I send them back into the world. They'd be a separate people. And through that, it is a, an orchestrated effort from God to be able to lead people to Christ through the drastic transformation that he has made in our life. This truth of or calling to separation has been with us from the beginning, and I think this was interesting to me as I was studying. You know, this thing of separation is, is nothing new. It's, it's not something just whipped up from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, listen, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light and said that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and evening and morning were the four, first day. So, from the very beginning, God, and I don't think it's by accident because we're going to look at this in just a moment, God from the very beginning separated light from darkness, and from that time till this, there's many different places in Scripture where he gives us the figurative illustration that there still is to be a distinct difference between light and darkness. In Matthew 22, we're told that darkness is a place of misery. In John 3, 19, we talk about uh, it being uh, darkness, being ignorance and, and a place of secrecy. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it's a place where wickedness is. This is all in the figurative form of darkness. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, we see that Satan is called the God of this world. But if your gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe night, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan and his rulers are called the rulers of darkness. And Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, 
that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. That is the children of darkness, the ruler of darkness. But in Scripture, Christians, God's people are called children of light. And those who are not of God's people are children of darkness. And since God has divided the light from the darkness at creation, he has always made a distinct parallel between light and darkness. As a Christian, we're commanded not to walk in darkness, John 8, 12 tells us. The Christian is commanded not to abide in darkness, John 12, 46. We're commanded to have no fellowship with the works of darkness, Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We're told to put off the works of darkness and put on light in Romans 13, 12. And we're reminded that God in him, there is no darkness. 1 John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is the light and in him is no darkness at all. You say, why all this Scripture? Why all of this foundation? Because I want us to understand that in this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, the command, the call of God is to come out from a dark world and be separate and be the light in this dark world that he wants us to be. God has separated light from darkness from the beginning, and God wants us to be the light that is set on a hill. And let us be reminded that looking forward, in the very beginning in Genesis, we see that God divided the light and the darkness. And looking forward, there will be a final time in which he divides. Once again, Matthew 25 reminds us, listen, there will be the words that come out of the divine judge that simply says, well done, enter into the joys of the Lord, or depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, and you will be cast out into outer darkness apart from the light. The light, can you imagine eternity without the light of God? the darkness, the separation, the, the, the lack of any hope whatsoever. It's very clear that God makes a distinction of light and darkness, and he says, come out from the darkness and be separate. Secondly, I want us to understand that living separate is not only a command of God, but living separated lives is the stipulation of having God's lordship in and over our life. Read it there in 17b and 18. It says, then if you, if you will touch not the unclean thing, you come out being separate, touch not the unclean thing, then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe one of the greatest, one of the greatest verses that combats the easy believism, all I got to do is pronounce with my mouth that he is Lord Jesus and he is Savior, and I can go on living the way that I want to live. One of the greatest verses is right here. It's very clear. He says, listen, if you'll come out from among them and be separate from the darkness and all that is involved there, if you will, then I will welcome you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, I remind us, if we're going to be a child of the king, if we're going to have his blessing, if we're going to have his favor, it's more than just lip service. It is you and I saying, God, you being my helper, I will be the light. I will be a separate people than that of this world. I like what Joseph Benson, the commentator, says, wherefore, encouraged, he says, by this gracious promise. And that you may obtain the fulfillment of it. Come out from among them. Withdraw yourself from all intimate society with them and be separate. As God's promise of dwelling in a particular manner among the Israelites obliged them to separate themselves from the converse of their heathen neighbors, that they may not be ensnared with their superstitions, much more are Christians obliged by the peculiar gracious presence of God, which they enjoy or may enjoy, to separate ourselves from the society of all of the ungodly, and listen, and to also separate ourselves from their sinful practices, from their customs, and from their habits." 
This is what it means to come out and be separate. We no longer embrace the sinful practices of the world. We do no longer embrace their customs, nor do we embrace the habits of the darkness, of sinfulness. We are a distinctly changed person when Christ becomes our Savior. And touch not the unclean thing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an important part of it. Keep at the utmost distance from every person and thing whereby you might be drawn into evil and contract guilt. And if you will do these things, I will receive you into my house, into my family, and I'll be a father to you. I will stand to you in the near relation of a father loving you, caring and providing for you, allowing you near access to and close intimacy with who? Myself as father. Saith the apostle Paul? No, it says, saith the Lord Almighty. It is a command of God. And it is what gives lordship in and over our life. I like what Adam Clark says, is it not plain from this in the following verse that God would be their God only on the ground of their taking him for such and that, is, and that this depended on their being separated from the works and the workers of iniquity. Those who will have the promises of God fulfilled to them must come under the conditions of these promises. I know this ruffles feathers today in our world when someone says you must because nobody wants to be told what to do. But listen, Scripture is clear. If you want the promises of God, you must come under the conditions of these promises. If they are not a separate people, if they are touching the unclean thing, God will not receive them and therefore will not be their God and and they will not be his people. That's pretty clear, plain, cut, but yet it is what it is. It says it as it clearly is. We must, by the call of God, come out from the world and be a separate people. If we want God's favor, his blessing and acceptance, we must come out and be a separate people. Number three, Living separated is not only a command of God. Living separated from this world not only is that which gives lordship of God in our life, in and over our life. Thirdly, living a separated life as God would call us to be proclaims boldly where our citizenship really lies. It is us making a bold proclamation, I am a citizen of another world. Philippians 3, 20, 21 says, but our citizenship, he's talking about a believer, a, a true born-again believer, is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. We as Christians are citizens of another place. Colossians 3.13 says, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. We are told we have one of two places to be citizens of, and woe be anyone who says, I cast my lot and I choose the citizenship of darkness and of the flesh rather than the citizenship of heaven. In different Old Testament and New Testament passages, the Christians are referenced to pilgrims and strangers and sojourners. It is vital for those who profess to be followers of Christ to obey the command and the call of God, separating themselves from, the world, to, uh, from this world, to pledge faith in God, and to obey this call and command would be, uh, to disobey this would be like uh, uh, someone who is trying to become a legal citizen of the United States of America, but yet when they stand before the judge and the judge says to this one, wanting to be a U.S. citizen, saying, are you 
willing in the oath to support and defend the U.S. Constitution and the laws of the United States against its enemies? Would you give up allegiance to any and other nations, sovereign, uh, and renounce and, and, the, and renounce hereditary or noble titles, if any? Are you willing to provide military or civilian service when called upon by the government to do so? It'd be like someone saying, I'd like to be a, a citizen of these United States of America, but if you're asking me to answer yes to those, I'm sorry, my answer is no. The judge would probably look at them simply and say, thank you, have a good day, goodbye. Because you cannot be the citizen of the United States without being willing to say, I'm willing to defend the U.S. constitutions and the laws of these United States of America. Listen, we cannot be a citizen of heaven unless we're willing to stand up and defend the best of our ability, the word and the truth of God that has been given to us. We cannot renounce this, God's holy word, and still expect God to say, welcome home, my child. We have to give up allegiance to every other nation and sovereign, announce every other title if we intend to be called a child of God. God cannot be our father if we are going then to go around and say, but listen, I have idols here and idols there. There's things here in the world that I still am attached to. We have to denounce the world and its entirety if we're going to come out and be separate from the world. And if God would call upon us to serve in any capacity, and ladies and gentlemen, he has called every single one of us to serve in some form or fashion in the kingdom of God, whether it be in a full-time ministry position of pastoring or evangelism or Christian day school teaching, whatever it may be, or it might simply be that I'm going to work my nine-to-five job, which I'm finding out is more and more like nine-to-nine job, whatever it is, and while I'm there, I'm going to show the love of of Christ. I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to lift up his name. Whatever it is, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be willing to say, God, you are my father, and whatever it is you ask me to do for the kingdom's sake, it will be done. I love the illustration of Beverly Shea. He attended a Bible school in Ottawa, Ontario. Of course, you know that he loved to sing. He was training in New York City when he was given an audition at one of the radio stations, and he was offered a, 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 a very uh, lucrative contract. As he was talking to the, to the one giving the contract at the radio station, he said, may I sing gospel songs? And he was told that he might use one occasionally, but really what they were after was the songs that were on that time, the hit parade, the popular songs on the radio of the day. What would he do? His mother was praying, and then on a Saturday night, she placed a poem on the piano. And as the story goes, it was in the morning when he saw that poem, he composed the tune for this. And here's how the words go. I would rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I would rather be his than have riches untold. I would rather have Jesus than man's applause. I would rather be faithful to his dear cause. I would rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I would rather be true to his holy name. Oh, Bev turned down the contract and a short time later offered another position in Chicago's radio station where he was able to sing gospel music to his heart's desire. And sooner there, he met Billy Graham and we know the rest of the story. Why was it? Because when he was given the option, do I use my voice for this world and its passing tunes or do I use it to glorify God? He said, I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause, than worldwide fame. And God took took care of the rest. I'm here to remind us today, ladies and gentlemen, if we'll come out from the world and say, I'm not going to use my talents and abilities for the filthy lucre of this world, but I'm going to do my best to use it for the kingdom of God. If we'll pronounce our citizenship, he will take care of everything else. I want to look at number four, living separated as the scripture would call us to be separated is fourthly a powerful testimony of God's grace and his transformational power. One of the greatest reasons that the Big C Church and Little C Church 
has seen a significant decline in power to impact this world. It's not because, listen, I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm tired of hearing the reason that the world is shrinking is because we have too many this and too many that. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is we're shrinking and we're not having the powerful impact in this world that we ought to have is because we're not having enough people inside the body of Christ that's willing to stand up and say, take the whole world, but give me Jesus. I'm not convinced for a moment that people are walking away from the cross and from Calvary and from Jesus simply because we have a rule book here or there. They're leaving because we're no different than they are. If we have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of a real, true, transformed life, ladies and gentlemen, that's what is missing. We're missing people who are willing to say, I'm turning my back on it all and I'm all in for Jesus. Unfortunately, too many people want God and the world. When the big C and little c church tries to merge the two, listen, the end result, I don't care how you divide it up, the end result is always the same, and that is nothing more than an anemic, weak religion that is attractive to no one but yet readily accepted by everyone. We have a host of people who love to boldly declare Jesus in his name and their faith with their lips, but they are absolutely terrified to live that change in their daily lives as a follower of Christ. It's easy to say, Jesus is Lord. It's another thing entirely to say, by God's help and grace, I'm going to come out from among the world and be separate that I might give a testimony of the power of God's grace and ability to transform a life. I read an illustration that takes us back to World War I. The pastor who was writing the illustration said that one of my predecessors at the 10th Presbyterian Church, Donald Gray Barnhouse, led the son of a prominent American family to the Lord. He was in the military, and he showed the reality of his conversion by immediately professing Christ before the soldiers of his military company. The war ended, and the day came when he was going to return to his pre-war life in the wealthy suburb of a large American city. He talked to Pastor Barnhart, uh, Bar Barnhouse about life with his family and expressed fear that he might soon slip back into the old habits. He feared his love for parents, his brothers and sisters and friends might turn him back from following Christ. You know, the Scripture says if we don't love him more than our family and friends and everything else, we're not worthy to be his follower. And he said, I just have this fear that down deep my love for them is going to keep me from really staying true. Barnhouse told him this, that if you would be careful to confess your faith in Christ publicly, God will take care of the rest. He would not have to give up improper friends. Listen, improper friends would give him up. Did you get that? We don't have to give people up if we are truly willing to come out and be from among them. People will just kind of leave us by the side. As a result of this conversation, a young man, this young man, agreed to tell the first ten people of his old life and whom he encountered that he, would be, he had become a Christian. The soldier went home, and almost immediately, while he was still on the platform of the suburban station, at the end of his return trip, he met a girl whom he had known socially. She was delighted to see him and ask how he was doing, and he told her, listen, the greatest thing that could have possibly have ever happened to me has happened. Oh, you mean you got engaged to be married? <laughs> how she came up with, no, I'm joking. You get married? You're, you're engaged? No, he told her, it's even better than that. I have given my life to Jesus Christ, and he is my Savior. The girl's expression froze. She mumbled a few polite words and went on her way. A short time later, the new Christian young man met someone of his old friend, Block. Oh, it's so good to see you back, he declared. Man, I remember some of the parties that we used to have, and man, I'm looking forward to getting together and having some of those old times become new. His simple words were, I've become a Christian. He was thinking, that is too. 
Again, the case of a frozen smile, a quick change of conversation, and they split. After this, the same circumstances were repeated with this young uh, man and a couple of two or three old friends. And by this time, word had gotten around, and soon some of his old friends stopped seeing him, calling him, texting him, calling him, or, or, or getting a hold of him. Texting was not there. I just put that in. That's why I have it written down. I should stick with it. He'd become a peculiar religious, they might say. Who knows? They might even call him crazy. What had he done? Nothing but to con confess Christ. And that same confession that aligned him with Christ simply said, I'm coming out from among them. I'm not going to go to the same parties that I used to go. I'm not going to hang out with the same places I used to go. I'm not going to be the same person that I used to be. Why? Because Jesus Christ is my Savior. And everything else took care of itself. You want to know why sometimes we're not making an impact in the world that we're living in right now? Is because we're not willing to stand up and say, listen, Jesus Christ is now my Lord and Savior. I'm not the same that I used to be. We still try to go to the same places. We still try to be the same person. We still try to live the same way. And ladies and gentlemen, that is nothing but dangerous ground, and it weakens the testimony and the power of the grace of God. He changes us entirely. If we're not living a come out from among them and be separate kind of life, we are promising a false example of what it really truly means to be a child of God. I'm going to close with this point, number five. Living separated, and I believe this is extremely important, living separated lives, as it says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord helps to preserve the holy ways of God. If we're not willing to come out <clears throat> from the world, how do we expect to see the way of holiness preserved? If we're not willing to be what God wants us to be, how can we expect this generation, the next generation, let alone three generations down the road, really understand and comprehend Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Over and over again in the Scriptures, we read in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are just to be separated. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you will know that there was a reason that, that the Jews, the nation of Israel, they were God's people. And we see over and over and over again, does not God look at his people and say, listen, I don't want you to go over there and start intermarrying with them. I don't want your sons to go over there in the heathenistic world and find daughters. I don't want you to allow those daughters over there to come into this Christian realm of the nation of Israel and, and find husbands for them. Do not allow it. Because why? In the New Testament, he reminds us, what fellowship does light and darkness have? What fellowship does holiness and wickedness have? What fellowship does those who live by the principles of God's Word and those who live by the the principles of the flesh and of this world what do they have in common ladies and gentlemen i'm here to remind you if you don't believe me read it in the old testament and you will find out every time the nation of israel disobeyed god and went into the other heathen nations and intermarried there was a great falling away and the nation lost their course if we really truly believe the song that we sing, Lord, I don't want to lose the vision. I don't want to lose the fire. I want to protect this heritage that has been passed down. Then here's how we do it. We come out from among the world and separate ourselves and simply say, I will not enter Mary, so to speak, with the traditions and the cultures and the habits of the world in which Christ saved me from. You cannot intertwine the two and expect that children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are still going to attend a holiness church and say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. They can't. You say, well, you're narrow-minded. You're talking about the little faction of holiness people. Listen, I know the body of Christ is broader than you and I can ever imagine, but you don't live there and I don't live there. We live here and God's blessed us with a wonderful message of holiness and therefore we have to stay true to it.
For centuries, separation from sin and even the appearance of evil in 1 Thessalonians 5.22 was preached from most, most pulpits and practiced by most people. Christians lived differently. They spoke differently. They dressed differently. They believed differently. They acted and thought differently. They were ashamed, as were their families, when they were involved in a sin or even imitated the lifestyles of the unsaved. A different way of living does not say, understand this, and I want this to be clear. A different way of living does not save anyone. Understand that. Not cursing, not chewing, not hanging around those that, that do is a good practice, but understand that in of itself does not save you or me. However, when one will acknowledge their sins, realize the price that they will ultimately have to pay for sin, and then will accept Christ's payment for their sin and accept him as their Savior, that person is now born again, given a new heart, and born into the family of God, freed from the penalty of sin. And that person who has truly been transformed has been transformed on the inside. And whether you want to believe it or not, Scriptures teach us that sooner rather than later, those changes changes are evident on the outside as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, most things are new. No, all things are new. That touches inside and out. The new-hearted Christian should realize that the way that he used to live is not pleasing to the Lord. And to please the Lord, we should want to separate ourselves from the sin and the temptation and the transgression. We are saved. This thinking and lifestyle are foreign to many in the Christian church today. And sometimes people inside the church will even ridicule the thought that we ought to be separated. Listen, you don't ridicule a preacher. You don't ridicule an organization. You are ridiculing the very voice of God when we say that that's not a big deal. It says, come out and be separated. I'll be your father. You'll be my children. One would be hard-pressed in many churches and Christian households to be able to tell any difference between those Christians and the unsaved. Church leaders and believers spend more time excusing and justifying and explaining their worldly thinking and lifestyles than they do remembering for once God's most important command is simply this in Leviticus and Peter, be ye holy for I the Lord your God am holy. If we would take as much as time as saying, Lord, help that to be part of my life as we do arguing and defending and fighting all of the things that we want in our life, ladies and gentlemen, the church world would be turned upside down and so would our communities. Many Christians fail in the area of separation. They do. I have. You have. But God, help us to have a heart that says, Lord, I will with your help be separated. Most often they will not separate themselves from the things from this world and separate themselves unto God. They want the comfort of knowing that they're going to go to heaven, but their sincerity seems to be lacking because they will not separate themselves from the places they ought not to be going, and they will not separate themselves from looking the way they ought not to look and talking the way they ought not to talk. They want to make Jesus palatable, but let me tell you, Jesus didn't say, go and make me palatable. He says, go and be holy, for I am holy, and let me take care of the rest. Oh, I know I'm only 44, but I've seen some fads come and go. I've seen the skirts long. I've seen the skirts short. Many Christians sometimes, unfortunately, were the, the first ones in the store to make sure they got the newest to look like everyone else. When the, barber cha when the hairs changed for men and Hollywood came out with the newest look and the newest fad, Christians were the first ones in line to the barber shop to simply say, that's how I want my hair. You say you're starting to meddle just a little bit. Maybe I am, but I don't think that I am. Later on, we need to be more concerned and fitting in with the Spirit of God than we are the Spirit of this world. You say you're going to go to hell for a haircut? No, I'm not. What we will get out of heaven are, is a spirit that says, I love this world more than I love the world to come. 
Oh, it would be far more helpful if Christians had the attitude, I am a Christian, and if the Bible shows me something to do, I'll do it without question. If the world thinks I'm peculiar, then that is their problem. But as for me and my house, I'll separate myself and family with the help of God from this world, its questionable behaviors, its look and its act, its talk, and I'll believe and I'll behave the way that God wants us to believe and behave. Remember when your mom used to say to you, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? I hated that question. I thought it was stupid. But many times I thought it was stupid because I knew that if they jumped, probably I would too because all of the things that she was just talking to me about led to that very same conclusion. We didn't like that admonishment. There are many people in the Christian world who are doing the same thing spiritually. We're doing what everyone else around us is in doing, and too many are following the world rather than the leading the world, rather than leading the world by Christ-like example. Oh, I understand. Listen to me. We'll get to it. Just we're we're coming to a conclusion. Thirty-eight minutes, and I had thirty-eight hundred words to read, and I'm down to the last page. Just be reminded, ladies and gentlemen. I understand. And here's where we kind of make excuse. Well, it's more than just looking like the world. I understand sometimes the Christian attitude reeks of flesh and, and world. Yes, the unforgiveness that is embodied by some of the holier-than-thou people stinks to high heavens. I'm here to tell you when you're a child of God, you come out from among them, you forgive when you don't feel like you can forgive, and by God's grace, he helps you to forgive. Your attitude is different. Your disposition is different. Yes, we are touched from the very tops of our head to the bottom of our feet. We are changed inside and out. Question or place that many, the question or place of confusion for many is simply this. Well, what is, what is it that I should separate myself from? What are the ungodly works, the wicked that I'm to keep away from? And I'll just tell you, that's a valid question. It's a valid question. People feel more comfortable with a list of sins. I've been there. It's easier to say there's the list. Yes, 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 no, 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 no. But because of man's devices and dealings in different times, listen, that list can change quickly. A list of sins from the Old Testament times would perhaps in its form there may not fit in 2022. Scales no longer have weights, and so the sin of false balances may not be valid in most today. However, the principle behind that sin of cheating and deceiving can still be applied today. Oh, there were no guns in 1200 B.C., but fatally shooting someone uh, that, that is still a sin, whether it be with a gun or whether it be with a stone, murder is murder. No, uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the thoughts of abortion, the word of abortion is not mentioned in the Bible, but the principle of not killing another or taking another life is clearly marked as sin. Many insist that the dress codes and the standards of the Old Testament were only for bygone days. But listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, the principle that honors the differences between sexes God created has not changed. He created both male and female, and simply moving a garment from a men's section to a lady's section does not change the circumstances. Many justify sin and lack of separation by saying today's difference, but I'm here to tell you sin is sin and it's always been. The principle of what is sin needs to be learned from the Word of God and applied clearly to our hearts. Man's lifestyles and possessions are constantly changing. A, lust, a list of what not to do will, will never be accurate for more than just a several years. But it's the spirit, listen, the spirit of doing the right things that must be established. And then an attitude of discernment that will hold true and guide one no matter what changes in the world. It is the spirit of God, the law, that needs to be the ruler to measure what is right and wrong, not simply being on 
on God's list of sins, which is the letter of the law. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, Who also hath made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a transformed heart downside that simply says, listen, you may not find the Word in the Scripture, but the Spirit is there, and God's Spirit is what I'm going to follow. Our musicians are coming. No singing this morning, just, just music. You know what I'm finding out? Simply this. That one of the best ways, one of the best ways that you and I can display the power of God's grace transformation in our life is to live as consistent as we can to the Word of God. And you know how to do that? The best way to do that is to get as far away from where you got in as possible. What do I mean by that? Well, I can't speak for everybody, but Brother Taylor, good to have you back. I can't go without calling your name. What I can speak from experience is this. I was up and down, up and down, up and down many times. And you want to know why? It's because when Jesus Christ did, let me tell you something. God was gracious to me, and he forgave me every time I came back to him and said, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Number 732, I'm sorry. But until I started taking the admonition of my parents, spiritual leaders in my life and the leadership of the Holy Spirit it finally clicked with me brother Roger and simply said this that if when I get saved I'd quit hanging around that spot and just start diving in deeper and deeper into the things of God I found out that I got further and further and further away from the sins that Jesus saved me from oh you said you're meaning to tell me that that you had to come up with greater lists, greater books, and greater volumes of things you can and cannot do? No, I'll tell you what it did. By diving into more and more of God and His love and His Word, I began to see more of the heart of God. I began to see the Spirit of God and, and His love for me, His patience for me, His kindness to me, and His desire for me. And I began to see more and more of that thing and, and, and that reality. And I just kept coming closer and closer and closer to God. And the next thing you know, I look back and I thought, why in the world, brother? Why in the world was I ever even, t why in the world would I ever want to go back? Why in the world would I even give an ear? Why why? Because the closer to the heart of God I came, the further from the world I got. And you want to know how we can live consistent, victorious lives that speaks to a world that's hungry? Get saved. Get in. Allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, purify you, that he might infill you with his spirit, empower you with his power, and just keep walking, walking. And the further we are from where we got in, the better we are in our life. And the greater glory we can bring to God. We're standing together this morning. The Lord calls us, separate, come out from among them and be ye separate. And it goes on to say, don't even touch the unclean thing. Get away from it. Don't play with it. Don't play around it. Get away, and I will receive you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters. If there's anyone here this morning that God has spoken to, or maybe you have a question of anything that I've said, I want you to know I always welcome the conversation because I want you to know my heart today is filled with love and I'm not pointing things out just to be stupid. I'm trying to say, listen, the command of God is we've got to be separated people. And God, would you speak to our hearts? And if there's anything in our life that is there that ought not be, speak to us. That, Lord, that I would be the light that doesn't shine vaguely, but shines brightly in this world that is so dark and needful of you. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. 
Dear Lord, we love each and every one of these people here, those that are online. Lord, but greater still, you love us, and you're faithful, and you're gracious, and you're patient. Oh, God, we ask that you would just speak to our hearts and help us to understand that being separate is not just about being odd. It is simply about being committed to the narrow way. God, if you would help us, give us the strength, give us the courage to be a separate people in every way. Lord, we'll thank you for the benefits that come with it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.